where our loyalty belongs to. You see this flag here? It's going to go on the floor. And to us, our loyalty does not belong to this flag. Our loyalty belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Of course, not all Muslims are like that. But we've been infiltrated with this kind of agenda. And uh, America has to wake up because we are strangling ourselves with our political correctness. There is tremendous deception in terms of saying one thing publicly and another thing privately. Yasser Arafat obviously was the master of this dual agenda in terms of openly supporting pluralism or nonviolence or condemning terrorism. I condemned completely these terrorist activities. And then secretly or behind closed doors supporting it. Sometimes you would find a Muslim who appears to be moderate. We were the first, as you may remember, post September the 11th, who said that the actions of flying planes full of innocent civilians into buildings is not legitimate. But uh, in his deeds, uh, he's not uh, as moderate as uh, he is. We are here to talk about the Magnificent 19. Those who, two years ago today, split the world into two camps, into the camp of Islam and the camp of non-Islam, or Kufr. Those who revived the obligation of jihad worldwide. The Magnificent 19. They were praising the hijackers, celebrating the attacks on New York. The deception is so high and so successful that I'm afraid we're losing the battle. In order to expose British terror groups like Al Mahujaroon and supporters of Sharia, Glenn Genvy collaborated with Jonathan Galt and acquired recordings of the group's meetings held in London mosques. The tapes reveal open incitement to violence and terror, in particular from Abu Hamza al-Masri, who calls upon followers to kill the kuffar, or non-Muslims. What makes Allah happy? Allah is happy when a has been killed. Abu Hamza, in one of the clips, is talking about the word kuffar, that if you are not a Muslim and you live in a Muslim land, you are like a cow. That's his word. You see, the Islamic rule, if a kafir goes into a Muslim country and he's walking by, he's like a cow going, anybody could take him. That is the Islamic rule, and this is the opinion of the fuqaha. It's not my opinion. If you read the books of, of jihad, you'll see. You can take him to market. You can sell him. A uh, kafir is walking by. He went, he went inside. You catch him. What, what, what are you doing here? Then he's a boot. You can sell him the market. You can kill him. If Muslims cannot take them to the, to, and, you know, and sell them in the, in the market, then you just kill him. It's okay. Hamza's a speaker, he brainwashes people. He gets funding, he sends them to commit murder abroad. Al Mujahiroon is a UK based Islamic pressure group with offices in Pakistan. 25 year old Abdul Salam grew up in London's Brick Lane. Now he's a recruiter for the Taliban. What's your involvement in recruiting and training young British Muslims? For well, the Muslims from Britain, there's hundreds of them that come over. Uh, from Britain to uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan. And what we do is we supply them with weapons, clothing, we, f we feed them, we shelter them. Yeah, I'm British, British born, British bred. Are you willing to kill British soldiers? I'm willing to kill British soldiers simply because of the fact that they're engaging in a war that is against my brethren. The links from the UK go abroad and back. This is what makes it a global problem. If you take the, the London bombings, the bombers were from Britain. They were from the city of Leeds, a two-hour drive north of London. British Muslims, but British. I and thousands like me have forsaken everything for what we believe. We are at war and I'm a soldier. Now you too will taste the reality of this situation. We are living with them. They are here. They're not outside our borders, they are here. So when you ask, is radical Islam a threat to Europe? Of course it is, because you find this, in, the very, this large and growing minority population that is growing more and more radical and rejects 
more and more blatantly, overtly, and stridently the societies in which they operate. They are using our laws against us. They are using our democracy against us. And they know it. They know exactly what they're doing. When you think just from a military perspective, forgetting everything else, the September 11th hijackers trained for their mission to attack the United States inside the United States of America. That is something unbelievable. Here these 19 Arab Islamic fundamentalists come to the United States, dress like Americans, get American driver's license, register in American flight schools, and in American flight schools, they learn how to destroy the World Trade Center with American jetliners. That is an unbelievable thing. That means that you don't need necessarily to have geographical uh, uh, territory on, at your disposal because you can use the geography Use the territory of your enemies in order to destroy your enemies. That is uh, the most postmodern type of warfare we've ever seen. I think the world, despite the number of attacks on various countries, is still in denial. They don't want to believe that someone has declared war on them. In the 1930s, the danger of Nazism was there. It was in everything Hitler wrote and said, in everything the Nazi authorities did. In the corruption of a whole generation of German youth through the propaganda of Nazism in schools. But people thought, well, this is a German problem. It's a limited problem. Uh, we have our own problems. We have our unemployment. And I think the same is true today. They don't connect the dots. They don't connect the acts together. They don't see that Islamic fundamentalism is a global network and a global problem. There is no terrorist threat. There is no terrorist threat. Yes, there have been horrific acts of terrorism, and yes, there will be acts of terrorism again. But that does not mean that there's just some massive terrorist threat. Uh, we have to worry about terrorism. If terrorism had struck on the West Coast rather than the East Coast, some of the folks in Hollywood might have a somewhat different view. People don't want to feel that this is part of a single threat, because if you come to that conclusion, and I'm sure it's the true conclusion, then you have to do something about it. If you ignore a real threat, like has happened in the past before World War II, uh, then the world will pay with many, many millions of dead. In Second World War, the West was sleeping. The Munich uh, Accords came to, regarding to what should we do about this Adolf Hitler who wants to take over Czechoslovakia. So, what did the parliament do in, in, in Great Britain? They got together and they said, well, we need to give Hitler land for peace. In return for Hitler's guarantee of world peace, Chamberlain and Eladje prevailed upon Czechoslovakia to give up the Sudetenland without a fight. In Britain, a happy Chamberlain came back declaring he had achieved peace, peace in our time. One of the most tragic and ironic scenes in all history. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Chamberlain believed that they could do a deal with Hitler, that Britain and Germany had a special affinity. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Winston Churchill had warned his country and his government that they were pursuing a disastrous course with regard to appeasing Germany. Peace, it wasn't peace. 